Let's bring on now the ambassador to Ukraine here in Singapore, Katerina Zelenko, to start our first anniversary coverage right here, right now on Money FM. Katerina, great to have you with us this morning. Yeah, we've we've had you on so many times over this past year, always hoping that we wouldn't be here a year later, and here we are. Yeah, that's the reality. Uh, looks like it's been a year of a revelation, rethinking of many things, not only in Ukraine, but also in Europe and in the world. And uh, even for Putin, it was kind of an eye-opener. He miscalculated so many things. He could not imagine that the resilience in Ukraine would be so strong that support from our partners and allies will come at once. And that is something that gave Ukraine strength. But again, we need to get real. There is a still a long road ahead of us. And um, for my country and for people of Ukraine, for many of them, it's been quite a living hell. Mm. Because, uh, yeah, every day you you live with the thoughts that something can happen so you can never feel safe and you can never secure safety for your children. Mm. Ambassador, let's stay with the positive, hopeful uh, aspects of it first. I mean, a year ago, Putin could not have imagined that A, Zelensky would have survived or not have been captured, B, that he would become the international figure, galvanizing figure that he's become, C, that he's giving addresses at the British Parliament, the European Union, with the entire support of the international community. He didn't expect that to happen. Obviously, you hope for that. How do you still find hope now? Oh, you know, we, we are a nation of people who are actually optimists. Ukrainians have always been strong with, through their optimistic thoughts that always uh, uh, accompany them, actually. And that's something that helps. But, you know, um, hope looks like the history takes its um, logical course. It means that we do not only withstand this aggression, we also liberate our territories sooner rather than later. And, uh, of course, this circle, and the war is always like a circle, will end with the punishment of the aggressor country. Because if the perpetrator cannot be brought to account, it means that um, no one can feel safe nowhere. And we need to um, realize what is actually our vision of the world we want to live in. If we want to live in the world where the might is right is one thing, then there is going to be a complete upheaval. Or we want to live in the world where everyone abides by the rules and um, we know that we could at least secure a predictable security environment for the future generations to come. Um, we're joined for our Ukraine War first anniversary special here on Saturday mornings, Money FM 89.3, by Katerina Zelenko, the ambassador uh, to Ukraine, uh, to Singapore, based here in Singapore. And uh, let's talk about the people for a moment. We've got tens of millions of people on the move uh, who have gone to Poland, who have gone elsewhere, uh, or who are just internally displaced. What are you hearing from your diplomatic sources, your family, your friends back in Ukraine? How is, how is everybody holding up? Um, it is um, quite similar, notwithstanding the geographic location of any region in Ukraine. If you speak with your friends, uh, if you speak with uh, uh, your colleagues, uh, everyone lives under the circumstances of the war. It means that you have to be every day prepared to go to the basement if you hear the air raid sirens. And over the last year, uh, there have been around 15,000 air raid sirens in Ukraine, which means that so many times people had to hide somewhere because otherwise you, you do not know what's going to happen next. Uh, but, you know, it's like um, not only enduring uh, all these terrible uh, days of war, but it's also like being resistant all the time because everyone is fighting. Everyone has his, his own front. Someone has to perform his daily activities and to walk. Mm -hmm. uh, someone has to help uh, the volunteer groups to provide food or something for the internal displaced people. So everyone really tries to do his or her part for 
um, for our safety. And that is something that makes us strong. In fact, we are 40 million army trying to resist this formidable enemy that one day will be defeated. Yeah. Ambassador, your resistance has been so phenomenal that you said right there, it has become a way of life. The downside to that is it's almost being taken for granted by the international media, meaning that when the war started, it led the news every day. Then it dropped to second, then it dropped to third. And now on most days, most international coverage, it's often fourth or fifth on the news cycle now because it has become almost a way of life for everybody. How do we change that? How do we make sure that this invasion stays front and center? Yes, you know, there's some certain deja vu with 2014 when at the very beginning mm. Ukraine was full time in the headlines and then slowly you could see less and less news on that while people uh, kept dying in uh, Donbass and the war was ongoing. Um, to prevent it this time, I think it's important for us just not to ask Ukraine all the time when the war is going to be over, but to ask what can be done to help Ukraine win this war. And I think everyone is interested that Ukraine wins this war because then we will see that justice prevails. Um, what can be done? You know, for big courses, sometimes even small gestures matter. If you just talk to people whom you know, if you just contact uh, the editors and or write a letter, or you put a sticker on your computer, or just buy a Ukrainian merch and wear it, um, all that can help just to keep the situation and the war against Ukraine in the loop. By the way, the proper wording matters too. We do not uh, speak about the war in Ukraine or Ukraine war or Ukraine crisis. It is war against Ukraine and it's very important not to play in the hands of the Russian narratives. Mm. Um, uh, when you look at the future and what are, what are you hearing uh, some of the best guesses uh, we talked about a possible trillion dollars worth of rebuilding and damage that's going to need to be done. What are the, are there any sort of initial plans of how Ukraine would approach that rebuilding of the, com the country? I know you've had to do some rebuilding already uh, just to get infrastructure back up and running and things like that. What is the, what is the foreign policy element of this? What does that look like from your perspective? I, I don't want to put the cart, too much in front of the horse, but it is a reality and it's something that's going to be such a massive challenge that even right now the rebuilding you're doing, I'm sure, is taking on its its own challenges. What, what, what could that possibly look like? Yeah, you're making a good point, um, Glenn, because actually, yes, Ukraine is going to become one of the biggest reconstruction projects in Europe after the war is over and we have really started the um, process of reconstruction already. Um, but we always need to keep in mind the magnitude of this international armed conflict. 77,000 of facilities have been destroyed in Ukraine, 49,000 of residential houses. It's really a huge amount. Mm -hmm. One third of the territories is, is mined at the moment. Mm -hmm. They need the mining. So there's so much that has to be done. Yes, in the small towns like uh, Bucha, um, there are some streets that you would not recognize because they have really been rebuilt already because the residents of the towns okay. have really put all the efforts to, mm. to try at least to reconstruct um, the cities and the roads. But still there's um, a lot of work that we have in, in front of us and we are really grateful to many countries, to our partners who have already committed to supporting Ukraine in its rebuilding efforts. I think we really should not wait. We should start it now because, you know, wars, it's all about people. And so people who endure all this terrible conflict and that reality and they need mm. to have homes, they need to, um, to see it, at least uh, to see that there are better days ahead of them. Yeah, Ambassador Zelenko, we're, we want to stay with you, of course. We do want to bring in uh, Samur Puri, who is the author of Russia's Road to War with Ukraine, The Invasion Amidst the Ashes of Empires. That book came out last year. And we, we talked with you last year about, that, about your book, Samir. Uh, a pleasure to welcome you into the studio as well. Uh, a year on, what are your thoughts based on the book you wrote and the predictions you were making and the observations you were making? What are you seeing now and uh, of how this has progressed? Well, thanks very much for having me. Great to be in the studio. I still think there's a bit of disbelief that here we are sitting in Singapore talking about the war in Ukraine. This, I still can't get over, the fact that this war in Europe has had such global resonance. I also can't get over in my head the scale of the tragedy 
And I think when I think of the Ukraine war, the first thing I think of is is tragedy. Having lived in Donbass, having friends who fled there, friends who are Ukrainian who are still living under a difficult situations. You know, the best sort of estimates that we've heard from Mark Milley, uh, a senior US general, is a uh, hundred thousand uh, Ukrainian service personnel casualties and many tens of thousands of civilians dead according to the UN. It really is an immense tragedy and it's had such disruptive impact around the world. That's not going to go away, that disruptive impact. That's the important thing. Just in terms of where I feel we are a year on in, we're still, it feels like we're in, in the middle of this. I think we're not at the beginning, we're not at the end, it feels like we're very much in the middle and we don't know how long this middle part will go on for. I think a lot of our questions will be answered over the next few months in terms of how the battlefield develops. Uh, when Ukraine receives the military assistance from foreign countries, the tanks we've all been hearing about in the press. Oh, and also Russia makes its moves as well because it's mobilized so many additional personnel last year, albeit the very varying quality. But both sides are committed. If I take a sort of neutral perspective, both sides are committed to their own conception of their war aims. Ukraine's, of course, are very just to defend their territory, to recapture it. Russia's, uh, from a different century, imperial conquest is still Putin's obsession. Mm. And we just don't really know how it's going to develop on the battlefield. Just to sort of a, a, a wrap all that up, the Ukrainians have have the, the sort of the justice of their cause. They have great leadership. They have so much goodwill internationally. But ultimately, they are fighting uh, on their own, albeit with a lot of material assistance. The Russians have got a lot of numbers on their side as well. I really, I wouldn't make any predictions as to what's going to happen. But, you know, I send my goodwill to Ukraine, and I hope they're able to recapture as much of their territory as possible. Let, let's stay with that, Samir, for a moment. You wrote the other book, of course, The Great Imperial Hangover, which encapsulates almost the mindset, you could argue, of, of, of Putin. Let's just go back a little bit, because you do talk about this in your books. He wasn't stopped at Crimea. When Syria came along, he warned the West not to send troops into a foreign country. Then he did it anyway, and he got, a, he got away with it, if you like. So he didn't stop at Crimea. He didn't stop at Syria. Now he's in Ukraine. He talks constantly about Mother Russia. This is taking Russia back to its natural borders of the Soviet Union. As you said correctly, it's become his obsession. He will not stop, as you've alluded to in your books. So where does this end? Well, it's a really important sequence of events that you, you just presented, Neil. And, you know, in some respects, he is a gambler who is intoxicated by his military successes. This is the biggest gamble of his career compared to the amount of resources the Russians have sort of invested in this. But um, I just want to point out something that uh, the ambassador mentioned earlier about 2014-15. That's the year I was there when MH17 was shot down. Mm -hmm. I was working as a ceasefire monitor. And that year I was there, sort of summer 2014 to end of 2015, Ukraine was really high in the news agenda. It was international news. It was making the news. And then it tailed off. And the question you've asked, Neil, is how, how does this end? Putin is calculating that international patience and attention does tail exactly. off. Exactly. And I just, one quick comment on this. The U.S. has... Uh, has given very generously 30 billion US dollars in security assistance in the last 12 months, 2 billion in the previous eight years, I think it is. There is a question as to how long the US can keep funding that amount of security assistance. So I do think we are in a little bit of a race against time. I don't think time is infinite here uh, because Putin's, uh, Putin's obsessions are, are pretty fixed. And you know, he's 70, coming to 71. He's thinking of his own legacy in imperial terms, thinking of himself as a czar. There's no talking him out of that mindset. So I think we just have to see how this year plays out. Mm. Just a quick follow-up, if I may, on that. So the, 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 the simplistic argument would therefore be remove Putin, remove the problem. How deep is this, as you call it, great imperial hangover mindset within Russia still? Does the problem go away with Putin or does the mindset remain? I think the problem doesn't go away. And a quick historical reminder, uh, Putin replaced Yeltsin partly on the basis that he could win the Chechnya war back in the 1990s when Yeltsin lost. There's a possibility that a further right-wing Russian politician tries to embody this mindset and says, you failed in Ukraine militarily, I'm going to take over, do the job properly. That's a bit of a warning from Russia's recent, recent history about the question you posed. Well, we're talking with uh, Samir Puri, uh, the author of Russia's Road to War with Ukraine, Invasion Amidst the Ashes of the Empires, and also Ambassador Katerina Zelenko, the Ukraine ambassador to Singapore. And Ambassador Zelenko, let's bring you back. Your, your observations on what you, we've just been hearing, uh, Samir, talk about the imperial Russia, this, this 
you know, manifest destiny, as of it was Mon called in Mother the U.S., Russia, yeah. uh, of, of Mother Russia to, to take back this territory and maybe other countries as well in the future. Yeah, we're very much on the same page. I think um, uh, the territorial expansion has always been a cornerstone of Russia's propaganda. And these imperial narratives are easy to sell to the inner audience. That's what Putin knows very well. But you also have to keep in mind that, in fact, Putin has gotten away with this type of uh, aggressive behavior for so long. After Georgia, after uh, occupation of Crimea, uh, war crimes in Syria, uh, murders in and outside Russia, and now what is happening now, looks like Putin has never paid a substantial economic and political price for that. Now the time has come. Yeah, that's extraordinary. I mean, just to add to that, uh, Samir, very interesting points you make. At some point, the money potentially could run out, or at least they can't keep that level of funding indefinitely. The international community, there's always that nuclear element, so there, there won't be boots on the ground. So then you look domestically within Russia, and I come back to that mindset. How much support is there within Russia for this invasion, for this mother Russia philosophy? Um, I couldn't answer authoritatively, obviously, sitting mm. here in Singapore, but based on what we understand, some of the Russian population, they really have imbibed this message very willingly because empires that have collapsed sometimes leave a scratch uh, that can be itched by the leadership that says, remember our past glories, remember when we weren't humiliated, remember when we were a truly great power. There's another side to it where some of the Russian population, they don't really have the options because the standard of living might be very low. There might be a lot of poverty. So, you know, a son or two sons go into the military. I mean, this is an honorable profession, but you may be living east of the Ural Mountains in relative poverty. What options do you really have? Final observation on this is that when you look at the map, the obvious point is Russia is still, uh, I think, an embodiment of its imperial conquests from a different age. I mean, that's how it's so large. Mm. Uh, and that's a very, very obvious point. But that's also why there are parts of Russia in the Far East uh, that, that, you know, look, look, to, look to China, look towards Southeast Asia, and that brings it to this region. One, Putin, one of Putin's gambles that has kind of worked is that the Western sanctions don't cover non-Western countries that want to keep trading with him. And that's an interesting yeah. insight into the way the world's changing. Yeah. It's a bit less Western dominated than it was 20 years ago. And Putin knows that too. Yeah. A couple of comments coming in on Facebook. Aloysius Lee, I'm praying for the Russia-Ukraine war to end very soon. Hopefully we don't see the second anniversary make peace, not war. Rob Salisbury, welcome back to Money FM. Mrs. Zelenko, loved your 2022 dialogue with Neil and Glenn in the early middle part of the, that year. Wishing you and your countrymen and women better days ahead in 2020. 23 well-deserved on your standing ovation at AmCham in Singapore last week, uh, your service to community in Singapore, cheering from Sydney. Uh, and Aloysius Lee, uh, wondering about the Turkey-Syria quake with so many deaths, he's talking about how do we, do we, how do we redirect money and, uh, and army to help the earthquake victims? Well, that's a great point, but obviously with so many poly crises happening, uh, you know, you can't necessarily take resources from one and divert it to another, even though the need is so great, uh, you know, uh, uh, what do you think about that, uh, um, Ambassador? Yeah, there are so many devastating tragedies happening in the world. And in fact, the world has not yet fully recovered after the COVID pandemic. There are so many pressing issues on the global agenda. And instead of focusing on tackling uh, um, sustainable development, cl climate change, and many other problems, mm. we still need to deal with the obsession of one authoritarian leader who one day decided to invade a neighboring country. So that means that maybe for us um, also there's kind of yeah, rethinking that what I actually started um, uh, my um, talk uh, with you from, that we all have to realize that we live in the world where you cannot take safety and security for granted. That means either we protect today the rules-based order and the UN Charter, or tomorrow no one can feel safe. Right. Mm -hmm. Samir, just come on to the military aspect. I'm fascinated by your comment, you know, this is a race against time. I was reading this week that Russia's army is estimated to have lost nearly 40% of its pre-war fleet of tanks. But of course, Ukraine's tank numbers have increased for two reasons. One, they've captured Soviet-era tanks, and of course, Western allies are slowly adding more to the fleet. However, the caveat, it's still half the size of Russia's tank fleet currently. How do you see that military hardware 
num it, will it become a numbers game moving forward? Will it be down to the number of tanks, the number of planes that might finally end this? Yeah, and the numbers of people as well, the mm. number of warm bodies, regardless of the training. There's obviously the tactical aspect is it depends how you use this stuff in order to be successful on the battlefield. And Ukraine's NATO training and NATO country training is improving its capabilities, as it has been since 2015, when Britain, Canada, America started more limited training after the first Russian invasion. But I'm reminded of the warning that the US intelligence agencies had publicized, which was through North Korea, Russia has been gaining considerably more munitions. And when you look mm. at the North Koreans, They've got a lot of Soviet-era equipment, probably sitting in big hangars and mothballed elsewhere. Just think about the transit route. It wouldn't be too difficult to get it to eastern Russia and send it across you know, the Trans-Siberian railway route and over it goes to Ukraine. So I think the Russians are probably replenishing as well. We just don't really know about it. And, and, and the final observation on this is I was talking to a Finnish friend of mine also as an academic studies military affairs, the Finns know about fighting the USSR. They know they fought bravely, they fought well back in, you know, in World War II at the outset, but the numbers ultimately turned against them. And that, I think, is one of the big military warnings from sort of modern history, is that no matter how hard Ukraine fights, there may be a point at which retaking territory becomes very, very difficult, especially territory like Donetsk City, Luhansk City, that you create that the Russians have occupied since 2014. It's a long yeah. time ago. It's it's really a 3D uh, chessboard, isn't it? The way all all of the different uh, moving parts here. I, I did read with interest uh, just yesterday uh, some of the 30,000 mercenaries that have been fighting with this uh, Wagner group, yeah. the mercenary group, uh, have either been injured or killed since the war began, 30,000. And we know that the number of, of traditional Russian troops as well has far eclipsed what Russia lost in Afghanistan. Uh, during during that incursion, uh, we talk about the number the numbers game here. Um, Samir, uh, are you are you hearing anything about the talk back home in Russia about uh, you know families losing their losing their sons and and just the massive? Is there any kind of internal pressure? In, in Russia because of that, or has that just all been shut down? So there, there is always internal discontent. I mean, when, when sons and husbands are coming back in body bags, they're not coming back at all yeah. because the bodies are being left to rot on the battlefield. Of course, there's going to be trauma and discontent in Russian society. Uh, in R Russia's recent wars, Chechnya, Afghanistan, you mentioned, mothers' groups formed quite spontaneously mm. to try to pressure the authorities for better treatment of their, their family members' return of remains and some dignified funeral services. The only issue, however, is that Russia has shown in history its ability to absorb what we would, certainly as a, as a Brit, I would look as treasonous levels of casualties in, in a military mm. operation. If you're a British or American general and you suffered this level of attrition in your combat forces, you'd probably be fired. And whereas the Russians are able to, mm. to say, compensate for some of their military in, in, effective, in effective military aspects by throwing numbers of people, and some of the Wagner mercenaries you mentioned as we know are prisoners the many prison. of them are prisoners yeah. which were seen as in a weird way i presume within the sort of the russian narrative of if you're finding some kind of salvation after your past misdeeds for mother russia again a point you mentioned yeah. mm -hmm. it goes to show how powerful those internal ideologies are how incomprehensible they might be to us as outsiders as well but i mean how far does it go though samir and i'll bring this back to the ambassador afterwards you know we've read the appalling stories of what the Wagner group has been doing, you know, sending prisoners out to the front lines, basically sacrificing them just to see where Ukrainian snipers might be housed. Can we have another 10? Can we have another 10? And they willingly go, well, they don't have a choice. They get sent to the front line. Okay. We found the sniper body after body. I mean, we don't need to go into the atrocities here. Does this have any resonance? Does it cut through at all with the broader Russian population that maybe we're going too far now? I mean, again, who knows how much they're actually hearing about uh, some of those specific details. But the other thing that the sort of the, the antidote that Putin is, is doing to the disquiet is this sense of an existential conflict between Russia and, and the West and turning what was all the NATO support that Ukraine is receiving is being turned into, well, we're basically fighting NATO now by proxy. So I think that is probably why, why the Russians are able to make that internal argument that this is a price worth paying. Mm. Yeah, I also have to keep in mind that the length of the, of the active front line is about 1,500 kilometers. Wow. It's like distance between Singapore and Bangkok, can yeah. you imagine? Yeah. So it's such a magnitude. And if we think that Russia lost within the Afghanistan campaign, 10 years of war, Soviet army at that time, 14,000 soldiers, and they lost in Ukraine 
140,000 soldiers within one year, 10 times more. And we are dealing with a regime, unfortunately, that is ready to throw as much cannon fodder into this meat grinder as is needed to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Katerina, let's leave the last word with you. We do have to go, but um, uh, look, your your hopes, your your wishes for the future, for you know the next few months and going forward. Yeah, I really hope that uh, this year will be the final year of this war. Ukraine has to prevail because it will not only be our victory, it will be the victory of Europe, it will be the victory of the whole civilized free world. That's what we all have to fight for. To In order to make a difference and to turn the tide, we need weapons, we need financial support, and of course we need support of so many people of goodwill across the globe who realize that um, the threat to one imperils the security of all. We are in the same boat and we need peace for the world. Thank you for that. Uh, Katerina Zelenko, the Ukrainian ambassador to Singapore. Also, thanks to Samir Puri, author of Russia's Road to War with Ukraine. Uh, much appreciate both of you coming on and sharing your insights about this on this first upcoming anniversary of the war against Ukraine uh, by Russia. And we, of course, hope send our best wishes to everyone who's impacted by this. So many people are. And